Ancient and Modern Britons, Chapter 7, Book by David McRitchie. This chapter will discuss the following The Hungarian Invasions, The Cimbri or Danes, The Black Heathens, The Early Danes of the Isles, Early Feuds and Intermarriages, The Black Danes as Picts, Complexion of the Hebrideans, The Dutch Colonists, Start of Chapter. Let it once be understood that the Picts of history were Blackamoors. The question next arises, could they have been related to the Scandinavians as some aver? Keatley says that the Picts, who early seized the Scottish lowlands, were akin to the Scandinavians, and Martin, in his description of the Western Islands of Scotland, says that it is generally acknowledged that the Picts were originally Germans, and particularly from that part of it bordering upon the Baltic Sea. While another last-century voyager, Pennant, in speaking of the Round Tower at Breshin, remarks thus, The learned among the antiquaries are greatly divided concerning the use of these buildings as well as the founders. Some think them Pictish, probably because there is one at Abernethy, the ancient seat of that nation, and others call them Danish, because it was the custom of the Danes to give an alarm in time of danger from high places. The writers I have quoted are rather old-fashioned and unscientific, but the opinions they repeat are held at the present day. Therefore, it becomes evident that some race of Scandinavians must have been black Huns also, with physical characteristics approaching those of the Pictish Moors, either in the Australioid or in the Mongoloid direction and since the Mongoloid belt stretches generally north of the Australioid, it seems likely that any possible Scandiavian Picts belong to the former rather than to the latter type. There really happens to be a tradition of a Hungarian invasion of Scotland. Hector Boos, in referring to this legend, tell us that while some write that they were Hungarians, others say that they were a company collected from Scots and Angles. This was in the year 875 the date of a Danish invasion of Scotland, but this statement recalls the Huns proper, of whom something has already been said. They, it will be remembered, united in their persons the qualities of the two great types under consideration. They were of a dark complexion, almost black, deformed in their appearance of uncouth gesture and shrill voice. They were distinguished, says Gibbon, from the rest of the human species by their broad shoulders, flat noses, and small black eyes deeply buried in the heed, and they were almost destitute of beards. They had attained to such a degree of power in the fifth century that they were able to exact an annual tribute from Rome, so that the empire might be secured from further injury. They had previously occupied all, the territories that had been abandoned by the Goths, whose dominions reached from the Baltic to the Euxine. After the death of Attila in 454, their power waned, and gradually, as Huns, they disappear from sight. Many centuries before the days of Attila, the provinces of Rome had been invaded from the north by hordes of barbarians, one section of which resembled the Huns in several particulars. Towards the end of the second century before Christ, the Romans, under Marius, had to repel the attacks of the Ambrones, the Teutones and the Cimbri, who poured into Italy in immense numbers, only, however, to suffer defeat. It is said of the Cimbri that 140,060 were slaughtered by the Romans and 60,000 taken prisoners, and this overwhelming defeat most effectually put a stop to their inroads, but before that they had in one battle destroyed 8,000 Romans. Lempriere, whose words have just been quoted, describes them as a people of Antient Germany, i.e. Scythia, who at one time inhabited that part of the country which now forms the modern kingdom of Denmark. They were very powerful, and in their invasion of the Roman Empire were so courageous and even desperate that they fastened their first ranks each to the other with cords. A quainter recorder than Lempriere has this to say of the Cimbri, Cimbri, Qui lingua gallica latrones di cuntur fest, vela gomero a quo originem deduxerunt, 
people of Denmark and Holstein, and a company men of vast bodies and dreadful looks, Jove. They made Annin Road into Italy, with a design to take Rome, but were beaten and routed by Marius, Anno UC 640. So that, about the period when one branch of the Hyongnu was invading the Chinese Empire on the east and south coast, another branch was carrying fire and sword through the countries to the west and southwest. There is scarcely enough evidence to fully warrant this conclusion, but there are some resemblances between the two barbarian hordes. Both were Scythian, though this does not mean much, and the vast bodies and dreadful looks of a sensui. Of the Cimbri suggest the broad shoulders and other dreadful looks of the Huns. The Huns were of a dark complexion, and so also were the Cimbri as shall be afterwards seen. Both were plainly of a warlike and nomadic disposition. They were both, in fact, Latroyus, freebooters, pirates. It seems likely, in short, that the Hyongnu were in Europe several centuries before the date assigned by Daginia, although fresh hordes swarmed westward out of Asia in the early part of the Christian era. The country inhabited by the Cimbri was, it is stated, the modern Denmark and Holstein, which, indeed received from them the name of Cimbrica Chersonesus, or the peninsula of the Cimbri. But those Cimbri are said to have been known by another name, Dani Idem Quicimbri, the Danes. It now begins to appear possible that the tradition of a Hungarian invasion of Scotland, contemporary with an inroad of Danes, is the memory of the arrival of one nation under two names. If this be the case, then the comely, fair-skinned people now inhabiting Denmark are out of the question, as having nothing in common with the Dani of vast bodies and dreadful looks. If it can be shown that the Danes, who invaded and overran the British islands in the eighth and succeeding centuries, and who were distinctly Latrones, or pirates, were also dark-skinned like the Black Huns, then the identification of the eighth-century Danes, who are confused with Hungarians, with the Dani or Cimbri, and again with the more or less Mongoloid Huns or Hyongnu, will be strongly suggested, if not established. It is stated in an account of their great defeat by Marius Chamler's Encyclopedia, Artemae Cimbri, that, when the battle was lost, the women who remained in the camp formed of the wagons killed themselves and their children. This wagon lager reminds one of Attila's similar camp on the plain of the Marne five or six centuries later, from the fact that they carried their women and children about with them, even when zero in the warpath. It is evident that the Cimbri or Dani were, like the Huns, a nomadic people. It is necessary, in steering one's way through the numerous invasions of the Northmen, to distinguish clearly between Norwegians and Danes. This is evidently done in the Pictish Chronicle the Norwegians being called Normanni and the Danes Danari. Ever since the Danes, or Dubgel, first came to Ireland, there had been a contest between them and the Norwegians, or Fingael, for superiority, and in 877 a battle took place between them, in which the Norwegians had the victor sevens. The Danes, being for the time driven out of Ireland, went to Alban, or Scotland. The mere fact of jealousy and warfare existing between the two does not of itself warrant one in concluding that the Northmen and the Eastmen, as Danes and Saxons together were styled by the Franks, were different in race, but it shows that they regarded themselves as different in nationality. Probably the name Viking also belongs to the Danes, and not at all to the Normans. It is as Danes and Vikings that the piratical hordes that plundered, burnt and destroyed along the Scottish seaboard are chiefly known, and it was by a treaty with the King of Denmark in 1014 that the Scottish King Malcolm succeeded in obtaining the withdrawal of these marauders from his country. However, the two peoples, Northmen and Eastmen, Norwegians and Danes, are also known by other names. Besides the general term of Gentiles, says Mr Skeen, that of Gaul, the Irish word for stranger, was likewise applied to them, and two nations were distinguished as Fingile, white or fair-haired Gauls, and Dubgile, black or dark-haired Gauls, the former being Norwegians, and the latter, Danes. 
But the typical Dane of today is not a black-haired man, quite the reverse, and dub means black without any word of hair. These two sections of invaders were also known as Finn Genti and Dub Genti, white Gentiles and black Gentiles. And as, according to Armstrong, Fion Loch Lineich and Dub Loch Lineich, white and black Loch Liners or Scandinavians. And in the wars of the Gaedil and the Gael, Gaels and Gauls, the Danari are styled Black Danners or Black Danes. In none of these terms is there any hint that the colour of the hair is indicated. But the expression used by St. Bershon in speaking of the Norwegians leaves no room for doubt. He calls them the Gentiles of pure colour. The Danes, then, were not of pure colour. They were dub, black. As black, at any rate, let us suppose, as the black Huns who were of a dark complexion, almost black. There can be no question about it. The designation given by the common people of one race to another is almost invariably founded upon some physical feature, and the most natural distinction is that of colour. Where the races differ in complexion, the invading whites styled the Indians of America redskins, and these again called their conquerors pale faces. A native Australian is a black fellow to the modern Briton, who, after all, is his exceedingly distant kinsman. Other blacks are roughly spoken of by us either under that title or under its other form as Negroes. Therefore, when the white races of Britain styled the Danes a black heathen, they simply made use of the most natural term that could occur to them. It was not only in Scotland that the Danes received this name, but throughout the British Islands. Let me give a few extracts from the Annals of St. David's, in Wales, Anates Menkvensis, which I obtained from Archbishop Baldwin's itinerary. Translated and annotated by Sir R. C. Hoare, J. It is a record of murder and rapine a sample merely of what was happening throughout the greater part of these islands at that period and before and after it. When a peaceful and partly Christianized people had to suffer every indignity at the hands of a ruthless and brutal race of pirates. Here is an account from the Welsh Chronicle. In the year 810, St. David's was burnt by the West Saxons. In the year 911, there came a great naive from Tidwike with Uther and Rahald and passed by the Western Sea to Wales and destroyed St. David's, A.D. 981. Godfred, the son of Harold, did gather a great army and landed in West Wales, where, spoiling all the land of Devet with the Church of St. David's, he fought the Battelle of Lanwanoc, A.D. 987. The Danes landed in South Wales and destroyed St. David's Lanbadan, Lanristed and Landidoc, which were all places of religion, and did so much hurt in the country besides, that to be rid of them, Meredith was fain to agree with them, and to give them a penny for every man within his land, which was called the Tribute of the Black Army, A.D. 1078. Menevia was all spoiled and destroyed by strangers, A.D. 1090. The Normans landed in Glamorganshire, and spreading themselves over different parts of South Wales, put an end to the predatory incursions of the Danes and other pirates. These words are Sir R. C. Hawes. The Normans in great companies landed in Divet, or West Wales and Cardigan, and built castles there, and so began to inhabit the countries upon the seashore. And to their protection the church and town of St. David's probably owed the tranquillity which they afterwards enjoyed. Here there is perfect unanimity, the Mucum Nigris Gentibus of the Annals and Powell's Blacker Army are at one. Thus we have as evidence these terms, Dub, used with four different nouns, nigger and black, all applied in the most natural and matter-of-fact way to the Danish pirates by men of presumably white race. Can anything be clearer? What may be called genealogical evidence of the existence of black-skinned races existing in Scotland within historic times has already been adduced in considering the Moors, and it is difficult to decide whether the examples given ought to be styled Picts, so-called, or Danes because both were Picts and contemporaries. And the very district which still bears the name of the ancient Moray men was also the very district in which the Danes lingered longest, that is, excluding the Isles. For which reason, 
it had become the hunting ground of the fair-skinned victors, descendants of Freskine the Fleming, Berowald the Fleming, founder of the powerful Innes family, and others of kindred race. Therefore, when a black man is discovered on a family tree of a thousand years ago, he may be either a Dane or a Pict. Of those, however, who are better known by the former name, there may be specified an ancestor of the Macklecods of MacLeod, that family being held to be descended at the date of Martin's visit to the Western Islands, and in his words, from Liod, son to the Black Prince of Man, which island was for a long time under the rule of the Danes. The father of this Liod was in all probability Olafa Svarti, or Olave the Swarthy, mentioned in the Flatean manuscript, who was king of man during the 13th century. A certain branch of the Campbells had also a similar lineage. Pennant speaks of Sir Colin, ancestor of the Bredelbane line, the famous knight of Rhodes, surnamed from his complexion and from his travels Duif Naroim, or Black Colin of Rome, and in a manuscript history of the Campbells written about 1827. The author says that Rishderin Dub Loch Oig, the Black Knights of Loch Awe, was the name then used by old Highlanders in men chinning the chiefs of the Duin, Campbells, who or their followers were probably the swarthy men from Lorne introduced in one of the legends. They must have been latterly displaced by a totally different race, as that member of the clan whom I have just quoted states that the Campbells nowadays boast of their yellow hair. Another and more distinctly visible member of this race may be seen in the beginning of the 11th century, in that memorable ship that carried the Northmen to the American coast. Now in Thorvard's ship was one Thorhall, who had been the huntsman in summer, and in winter the steward of Eric the Red. He was, it is said, a large man and strong, black and like a giant, silent and foul-mouthed in his speech, and always egged on Egjadi Eric to the worst. He was a bad Christian. But a still more notable black Dane was Earl Thorfinn, son of Sigurd, the most distinguished of all the earls in the islands. His deeds are recorded with some minuteness in the Orkneyinga saga, and he is also referred to in the saga of St. Olav. Earl Thorfinn was very precocious in his education and in every improvement. He was a strong man and ugly and of great stature. When he grew up it was manifest that he was avaricious, harsh and cruel and sagacious. Now Thorfinn became a great chieftain, one of the largest men in point of stature, ugly of aspect, black-haired, sharp-featured and somewhat tawny and the most martial-looking man. He was then five winters old when Malcolm, King of the Scots, his mother's father, gave him an earl's title and Caithness to rule over, but he was fourteen winters when he prepared maritime expeditions from his country and made war on the domains of other princes. On the day of his great and victorious engagement with the army of Carly Hunderson, King of the Scots, his appearance is thus described. He had a gilt helmet on his head and was girt with a sword, a spear in his hand, and he hewed and cut on both sides. It has been related that he was the foremost of all his men. Earl Thorfinn held all his rakes till the day of his death, so that it was said that he was the richest of all the earls of Orkney. He was possessed of nine earldoms in Scotland, the whole of the Sudris, and a large Rifki in Ireland. Earl Thorfinn was five winters old when Melkolf, Malcolm, King of Scotland, his mother's father, gave him the title of Earl, and he was Earl for seventy, or sixty, according to St. Olav's saga Winters. He died in the end of the reign of Harold Sigurdsson and was buried in Christkirk, in Birgisharadi, which he had caused to be built. This is from the Collectanea de Rebus Albanids pages, 340 and 3M46. Mr. Skene places the battle against Kali Hunderson at Burghead on the Mauritia coast. He identifies this Kali Hunderson with the Shakespearean Duncan, and he states that Thorfinn and Macbeth were probably allies, if not actually one and the same person, for there is more than one instance of a confusion between these two names, pointing to such a conclusion. It is curious to reflect that if Thorfinn and Macbeth were one, then the memorable duel in the play was between the son of a black, himself either a black or a mulatto, 
and an ugly black-haired, sharp-featured and somewhat tawny giant. I have quoted a few more sentences than were necessary to the proving that Thorfinn was not a fair white, because it is important to bear in mind. What the sagas and Mr. Skeen's maps reveal, that Scotland was for several centuries a dependency of this mixed, semi-mongoloid race. About the period of Thorfinn's exploits, this nation ruled over the greater part of Scotland, over the present counties of Sutherland and Caithness, a large part of Ross and Inverness, the whole of Argyllshire, Galloway, the Northern Islands, the Hebrides, and the Isle of Man, besides large districts in England and Ireland. Caithness was so identified with the Danes that until within recent times, called de Reb Alb, p. 307, it was known to the Highlanders by the name of Galif. The islands of the Gauls, the Hebrides, Galloway and Galway have all received their names in this way. Mr. Skeen, but it serves to show how the Danes and one or other of the Scottish races were so closely allied as to make it a question whether they were not actually the same people. What this syllable, Finn, or e find, as the Irish annals have it, precisely denotes, it is not easy to determine. It occurs in a large number of names and is translated white, which is probably the correct rendering. At any rate, it is so translated by all the highest authorities. And yet Thorfinn, or Fintuir, as he is elsewhere called, was not white, but somewhat tawny. But it is found in at least one instance, along with a Mongolian characteristic. A celebrated leader under Harold the Fairhead was Kaitil Finn, who is also called Kaitil the White. But he was known besides as Kaitil, or Ketil, Flatnose which points to the possession of Ugrian blood. One is almost tempted by this to construe Finn Gauls and Dub Gauls into white and black Huns, thereby explaining the disputed etymology of the name Finn as applied TR, the Finns of Finland. It will be seen in another chapter that there is other evidence tending to support this theory, but the great objection to it is the fact that the Finn Gauls are stated to have been the Northmen or Normans, who are understood to be pure Zantochroi. This kettle flatnose was of noble descent and was des patched to the Hebrides by Harold to bring these islands under subjection, which he succeeded in doing. There is some discrepancy as to this, one account stating that he subdued the Hebrides independently of Harold. He attained to great power, and a daughter of his, Audur the Wealthy, was married to Amleif, or Olaf the White, King of Dublin, who had previously been at war with his wife's father for the Irish Annals Record in the year 857, a victory by Ivar and Olav over Kaitil the White, with his Galgale, the mixed Scandinavian Gaelic people of the Hebrides in the lands of Munster. A son of this marriage is known as Thorstein the Red, which, if this term indicates the complexion, seems to suggest a mixed lineage. This same Olaf the White seems afterwards to have married a daughter of Kenneth MacAlpin, who was himself of mixed blood. Indeed, whether one looks at the question from the Pictish or from the Danish side, one sees plainly that a great fusion of races was going on during a period of several centuries. Also, Harold Harfager himself, whose appellation alone would hint that fair hair was an exceptional feature among his people, was the son of Halfdan Svarte, or the black, and it is therefore to be presumed that the fair hair was inherited from a white mother, and since Harold II, surnamed Graffel, or Greyskin, was the son of Eric Bloodyx, who was of the Finn Genti, it is as evident that the Greyskin came through a tawny mother. Feuds between near relations seem to have been quite usual at this time. Not only did Olaf the White war against his father-in-law, Ketil Flatnose, but also, in the year 865, he, along with his Gentiles, laid waste Pictavia and occupied it from the Calends of January to the Feast of St. Patrick, the then King of the Picts being the brother of his other wife, Kenneth MacAlpine's daughter. It was only a natural thing, therefore, for Constantine, his brother-in-law, to kill him in the following year as he was withdrawing with his booty. This Olaf must have been a restless and daring warrior, for at another time the stronghold of Alclyde Dumbarton, 
was besieged by the Northmen under the same Amleif, along with Imhair Ivar, another of their kings, and destroyed after a four-month siege. On this occasion they appear to have also attacked both the Picts of Galloway and the Angles of Bernicia. For in the following year we are told that Amleif and Imhair returned to Dublin from Alban with two hundred ships and a great booty of men, Angles, Britons and Picts, was brought with them to Ireland in captivity. It is apparent then that the Fair Whites and the Dark Whites were much more widely separated by physical characteristics at the time of the Danish conquest than at the present day, so widely separated indeed that dark whites were only beginning to make their appearance, or had not been on the scene for very long. The titles Finn and Dube were still more frequent than Don. White and black occur very frequently. Not only were there the white foreigners and the black foreigners, but the Pictish Chronicle has also mention of a native race which Mr. Skeen decides were the white Tisians, a white people of the Tees. And on the other side, one of the pedigrees accredited to Olave the White, for there is a want of unanimity as to his lineage, states that he was the grandson of Frodi the Gallant, whom the Svertlings killed. That is, whom the Black Dwarfs killed. From the Laxdala Saga, as quoted in Col de Rebent Albe P. 67, in the Scandinavian mythology there is mention of a race known as the Inglings, if the syllable ingi taken as equivalent to ing, which Halliwell defines as a meadow, generally one lying low near a river, then these people would one afkate, like the swarthy damnoni or moors, and if ling be accepted in its diminutive sense, then the inglings were marsh dwarfs. That they were probably one with the svertlings or islak dwarfs will be pointed out afterwards. The Danes, then, were like the Moors, black. Like them, too, they were Picts, as more than one eminent writer has proved. The title of Gormd at Wodestained is not confined to Highland genealogies. It was the actual name of a grim old pagan Dane who ruled over Denmark in the earlier part of the 10th century, and the word survived lately in that province of the Black Gentiles, Northumberland, where it bore the significance to smear, to duv. So also were the Picts, known as such, at home on sea as well as on land, like the Danes. In the year 729, the Irish annals record that three ships of the Picardach were wrecked this year on Iruas Cuisine, and ten years previously there had been fought the maritime battle of Ardnesby between Duncan the son of Beck with the tribe Gabran and Selbach with the tribe Lorn in which battle certain chiefs were slain. Whether as Danes or as Picts, they were a swarthy, piratical race, and it is interesting to notice that the Tom of tattooing has survived longest in their professional descendants, our own seamen. It is stated, I see, that although this practice was condemned in the year 785, it was not wholly rooted out of England till after the Norman conquest. It is really not wholly rooted out yet, but before leaving the consideration of the complexion of the Danes, it may be well to make a few more remarks thereon. The islands which were specially their home in Scotland since an unascertained epoch are or were known to the people of the mainland as Inchigol or Inzigal, the Isles of the Foreigners, and to this day an islander Winze Anach means an Indian, and although the black heathen were expelled from these islands many centuries ago, and although, as a distinct race, they have almost vanished from Europe, yet there may be traces seen of them even yet in the physique and the complexion of their descendants, whether in the Hebrides or elsewhere. It would be impossible to decide with certainty who are their descendants and who are not, but so far as complexion goes, the Moors are still largely represented throughout the British islands, although of course the crossing and recrossing of thirty generations while increasing the number of descendants, has lessened the intensity of the resemblance to the ancestral stock. But the swarthy hue asserts itself still, though in a modified degree. Last century, when Martin described the western islands of Scotland, he remarked that the complexion of the natives of Skye was, for the most part, black. Of the natives of Jura, 
He said that they were generally black of complexion, and of Aaron that they were generally brown, and some of a black complexion. The inhabitants of the Isle Giguet presented a greater mixture, they were fair or brown in complexion. He also repeats an anecdote of a gentleman, a native of Skye, who it did when a boy disoblige a seer in the Isle of Rasse and upbraid him for his ugliness, as being black by name and nature. At last the seer told him very angrily, My child, if I am black, you'll be red ere long. Which saying was next day accepted by the boy as the prediction of a cut on the forehead, which he then received by some accident. And Pennant, speaking of the Islay people, describes them as lean, withered, dusky, and smoke-dried. In their memorable tour through the north and west of Scotland, Johnson and Boswell several times took notice of the swarthy colour of some of the natives. It will be remembered that Boswell said of the mixed race of the Macraes. There was great diversity in the faces of the circle around us. Some were as black and wild in their appearance as any American savages whatever. And he may have had their complexion before his mind's eye when he said of some of the islanders, our boatmen were rude singers and seemed so like wild Indians that a very little imagination was necessary to give one an impression of being upon an American river. And when he particularized, at another time, a MacLeod, a robust black haired fellow, half naked and bare headed, something between a wild Indian and an English tar, this MacLeod was a true descendant of the black prince of man. What an English tar of Boswell's day resembled will appear in another place. A later writer than Boswell, writing forty or fifty years ago, speaks thus of the people of Harris. In general the natives are of small stature. Scarcely any attain the height of six feet, and many of the males are not higher than five feet three or four inches. There is nothing very peculiar in the Harrison physiognomy. The cheekbones are rather prominent, and the nose is invariably short the space between it and the chin being disproportionately long. The complexion is of all tints. Many individuals are as dark as mulattoes, while others are nearly as fair as Danes, modern Danes, of course. In so far as I have been able to observe, the dark race is superior to the fair in stature and strength. In respect to intellect, they are acute, accurate observers of natural phenomena, quick of apprehension and fluent in speech. In their moral character they are at least much superior to the population of most of the lowland parishes. F. And finally, one who has every right to speak upon the characteristics of the Western Islanders gives us the following picture of a Highland girl. In the warm nook behind the fire sat a girl with one of those strange foreign faces which are occasionally to be seen in the Western Isles, a face which, at the time, reminded me of the Nineveh sculptures and of faces seen in St. Sebastian. Her hair was as black as night, and her clear dark eyes glittered through the peat smoke. Her complexion was dark, and her features so unlike those who sat about her, that I asked if she were a native of the island, and learned that she was a highland girl, that is, from the mainland. She did not differ in complexion from the people beside her, who were the short, dark natives of Barra, and the difference in feature is accounted for, says Mr. Campbell, by the supposition generally current there that she and others like her are the descendants of the Spanish crews of the wrecked armada. There is no reason to discredit such a belief which, if correct, would place this girl out of court as a witness to Danish blood, the short, dark natives of Barra being indeed themselves sufficient. But it may not be necessary to go so far away from the Hebrides to find an explanation of a gypsy face among the people of these islands, or of the neighbouring highlands. Whether we look, therefore, at the Danes of history or at the people who today have the best claim to be regarded as their descendants, we see before us men of swarthy skin, and what is more we see that Meredith and the southern Welsh of the tenth century were by inference Xantacroy. And the extracts proving this have also shown, to those of us who were previously in ignorance, that the Welsh of Cardiganshire and other parts of West Wales are largely, if not wholly, Normans, and since Pembroke was in the 12th century partly peopled by Flemings, 
there must also be a considerable infusion of Flemish blood among the Pembrokeshire Welsh of today, so that in Wales, as in the Scottish Highlands, an immense number of people who believe themselves to be Celts, and who are full of enthusiasm on the subject of the Celtic languages, which they regard as the immemorial speech of their forefathers, are in actual fact the descendants of Flemings and Normans of eight or nine centuries ago. And a Welsh Jenkin, Jan Chen, whose ancestors have intermarried with Watkins and Wilkins, Watchen and Wilchen, has as little to do with the Britain of a thousand years back as have his Scottish kinsmen who descend from Freskine, or from Innes, or from Fleming. In trying to discern the lineaments of this or that variety of ancient Britain, we must disregard such Celts altogether, and they are not few in number. I am convinced, says Professor Skeert in the brief notes preface to his etymological dictionary, that the influence of Dutch upon English has been much underrated, and a closer attention to this question might throw some light even upon English history. We read of Flemish mercenary soldiers being employed by the Normans, and of Flemish settlements in Wales. Where, says old Fabian, I know not with what truth. They remained a long while, but after, they spread all England over. Like the Norman and other immigrants, they gradually identified themselves with the people of the district in which they settled, and so became Welshmen, Englishmen, and Scot. Their descendants fighting against each other under these names, fully believing themselves to be, as by intermarriage they to some extent were, Welshman, Englishman, and Scot. If blood relationship counted for much, they would not have lost their nationality so easily. But the ties of mutual interests are vastly stronger than the ties of blood, and the American of next century will not stop to consider his lineage if his country should happen to fall out with any other power. So the Fleming, as the Norman, became eventually a clannish Gaelic-speak-ing Highlander, or a bigoted Welshman, or, picking up a few new words, dropping a few old ones, and modifying his accent, he became an Englishman. To return to the swarthy people, if the earliest races of Picts or Moors were expelled from the districts in which we now find dark people, or were wholly exterminated there, such people will become the probable descendants of the black strangers who overran our islands at a later date. And thus the small swarthy Welshman, the small dark Highlander, and the black Celts to the west of the Shannon are, as likely as not, the living representatives of the Danes. While, on the other hand, it is evident that the Flemings, the Norsemen, Gentiles of pure colour, their kin the Normans and the Celtic tribes represented by Prince Meredith, the Fionnan of tradition and the barbarian prisoner of South British race, are all substantially one people, the Xanthocroi of Professor Huxley and the fair-skinned Germans of the Romans.